brothers and my sisters Only they can understand Fight this war together Together we will stand Hey everybody, it's Joe and thanks for tuning in to TVO Campfire. What this show's about is about successful veterans and they're bringing you the stories and their experiences. And we hope that it can provide inspiration to each of you out there, or maybe a veteran that you know to help in their life. Welcome to At TVO Campfire. We are excited to have you with us to share veteran stories. And today we have the owner and operator of Third Day Coffee Seguin. He is a Bible-believing follower of Christ Jesus, an ardent patriot, as well as a passionate supporter of our armed services, police, and first responders. He served in the United States Navy and Texas State Guard under the governor of the great state of Texas. Today, he serves the King of Kings, where he just does everything that he can to really help others and just more. So we'd like to welcome to the show, Jose Roberto Alanis Jr. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We are so excited to have you here and to hear your story. There's so much that you have to share. And so, Joe. Hey, man, I, I want to say uh, one thanks for doing this show today. Uh, Rebecca kicked me your information one night when we were actually doing the clubhouse, uh, one of our clubhouse events, and uh, then she was able to pull you in, talking to you and everything that night. And I was like, yep, he'll be our first ever coffee roaster that we have on. And then uh, the more and more that listened to you in the story and dug into, uh, you know, the, your third day coffee there in Seguin, I was like, yeah, man, this, this would be pretty interesting for others, uh, especially on the entrepreneur, shot, uh, entrepreneur side of the house you know, for vets that want to go that route, uh, I'm sure that you'd be a great point, point of contact on um, how to be a knuckle dragger and uh, really grinding that stuff out. So thanks for doing this. And uh, what I like to do, um, I like to go back and go back to the very beginning, um, literally, and kind of work up to where you are today. So tell me, one, where you were born, and two, what you did as a kid that, uh, that that still stands out in your mind today, even if it means you got in a lot of trouble. Let's hear it. Okay. Uh, I was born in San Antonio, raised here. Uh, my family is originally from Atascosa County, which is about an hour uh, south of San Antonio. Uh, and so... Uh, my dad comes from a big family with my immediate family. It's just me and my sister. Uh, but we have a ton of cousins and we were all really close. And so uh, we didn't get in a lot of trouble. Uh, we were scared of our dads. And so, <laughs> so we didn't do much to step out of line. Uh, but my, my dad and his youngest brother were both military. My dad was uh, in the Air Force in the 50s. Um, and he was a, uh, intelligence guy before they had any kind of technology. Dad did a lot of hands-on stuff. And that's, that's all I'm going to say about him. Uh, my uncle who was also air force, they were both crypto techs. Uh, he was in Vietnam and, um, and he, he ended up after Vietnam stayed in the military, did his 20, I think he did 25 or 26 years, uh, and retired. And so I, I grew up knowing, absolutely knowing that I was going to join the military. Uh, that was never a doubt in my mind, ever. That's what I wanted to do. Um, I had an uncle that was, and this is just the Alanese side. Um, I had an uncle that was a um, great uncle that was in World War I. There were like eight of them that were in World War II. Uh, and then my dad was just after Korea. My uncle was in Vietnam. Uh, I came in during the first Gulf War. Um, I didn't go anywhere, but but I was in during that time. 
and then uh, I've got lots of family on the LNE side that that went in, you know, to uh, after 9/11. And so it, I, you know, I grew up a regular kid. I went to private Catholic military school from kindergarten till I graduated high school. And um, in high school, it was uh, it was mandatory for freshman sophomore year, and then it was a choice uh, after that. And uh, I tried to get back in, but apparently I was I was a sad sack, and so uh, the. <laughs> I was not squared away enough to to be selected to continue the last. Year. Well, so I have not heard of a private military Catholic school. So that's that's really interesting. But you knew early on that this was something that you wanted to do. Did you have in mind which branch you wanted to go, or were there some influence? either by family or a recruiter that you went to or friends? Yes, I, uh, I was gonna go Air Force and I was gonna be a crypto tech just like my dad and my uncle. Uh, and, um, and funny story, I uh, started working with a recruiter my junior year and then I did delayed entry uh, during my senior year. And when I was supposed to graduate, the Air Force had a freeze on recruiting. And so when I graduated, I couldn't go, I couldn't go. I had to wait. And so my recruiter told me, okay, come, come to the office every Friday, check in, you know, as soon as this thing's over, we'll get you in. And so I, um, that's what I did. And one Friday when I went over there after school, that was all the lights were out in the air force recruiting office. And there was this old crusty uh, Navy chief sitting in the doorway, you know, of this building smoking a cigarette, you know, you know, we offer the same things that the that the Air Force has, you know, and, and uh, I was out of money and I didn't have a job and I needed something. And I, and so I was like, well, you know, my dad's a crypto tech and that's what I want to be. He's like, well, we have crypto too, you know, and that's not what he gave me, but, uh, you know, that's one of those stories about <laughs> what the recruiter tells you, what you actually get. And so uh, I ended up going in uh, as a communications, uh, low voltage electricians, as they used to call us, uh, uh, interior communications electrician was my title. Um, and, uh, and I left for boot camp and, and uh, in, I think in 90, May, March of 90. Um, and I stayed in, I got out in uh, October of 95. And, um, and then I just struggled for years to uh, find a job that, um, you know, the military's got such a dynamic environment because you don't know what you're going to do. It doesn't matter what branch of service you're in. Uh, it's just dynamic, you know? I mean, you know, in my dad's day, it might have been, hey, go paint those rocks white. And like, what? Uh, you know, but in the Navy, it was on a ship it was so dynamic you had so much equipment that belonged to you and i might be working on the flight deck equipment one day or i might be working on the sonar equipment the next day or whatever. yeah they definitely will kind of place you instead of you placing where you want to be within the organization itself so but i want to go back for a minute because there's something really we haven't discussed on the show that you brought up that many veterans and those who are on active duty experienced before they went in, and that is enlisting under the delayed entry program, the DEP program. And so some are in the DEP program for a short period of time, and some even for a little bit longer period of time. But many people who haven't or it wasn't available at a time that they enlisted may not be familiar with that. And so from your experience, can you share a little bit about that particular program? Absolutely. Um, it was a little, a little bizarre because I actually swore in and, and did, went through that whole process twice. So you do it when you, when you uh, go through the delayed entry program, uh, you raise your hand and you swear the oath just like you would uh, going on active duty or whatever. And then uh, when they actually, uh, when I actually got to go, uh, when I went to MEPS for the last time, then I, I did it again. 
Uh, and the first time I did it with the Air Force recruiter, and then the second time, you know, obviously it's with the, with the Navy recruiter. Um, but I was in delayed entry probably for just a few months, really. Um, I want to say I started working with him in January uh, with my Air Force recruiter. And, um, and so by, you know, I, I had to wait. I knew I had to wait. It was almost a full year. I kind of graduated with me. Uh, until I so did. in essence, the way the delayed entry program works is you enlist in the military and then you wait for an opening to go to boot camp or basic training, depending on what the MOS is that that branch of service wants to fill. And so during that time, you remain sort of a civilian in a way, but even though you've already sworn in and Many recruiters will, and sometimes it'll be a delay because of a certain condition, a medical condition, a weight requirement or something like that. But during that time that you're waiting for your date to go to your basic or your boot camp, oftentimes that recruiter is molding you to be prepared when you get there so maybe running with you a couple of times a week or helping you learn um, some of the basic knowledge skills that are needed how was your recruiter during that time period for you so i was with the air force guy most of the time until the very last minute literally and he was awesome his name was machado i still remember him uh, he lived probably about a mile from my house and so every morning I would run to his house, we'd go PT, uh, and then I would go home. And I did that for months and months until, you know, uh, and unfortunately I never got a chance to talk to him after that Friday that I went, cause he was, there was nobody in the office. And I went over to the Navy guy and I mean, a month later I was in boot camp, And so I never got a chance to, to go find him and tell him, Hey man, you know, I can't wait any longer. I got to go. And uh, he knew there was a sense of urgency for me. And it wasn't so much because I was destitute. I wasn't, I was living at home. Uh, but in my mind, you know, that was my course of action. I was going to graduate high school. I was going to go to the military and I was waiting and waiting and waiting. And so I was, you know, the proverbial chomping at the bit and that, that was me. And so I wanted to go and I did. Hey man, I this is probably the the longest I've ever sit quiet on the show, <laughs> sitting there watching you go through this <laughs> and listening and everything. But, um, it, you definitely got a a good kick to it, man. I like it. I like everything that you're doing. Uh, as a kid, what was it that you found? You know, was like for me, it was hey, let me go grab my bike. I'm going to ride around a neighborhood. I'm going to jump ramps. I mean, I, I was constantly just on the go, 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 go. How was your life as a kid growing up like that? Um, you know, it was a different time altogether, right? Because uh, pretty much mom was like, okay, go out, go play with your friends, get out of here, come back when it's dinner time. You know, it's not the case today. Um and so we, we, you know, I had friends in the neighborhood. We, you know, we played street football and, and rode our bikes and stuff like that. But um, I used to, you know, dress up in my dad's, it wasn't his clothes, but, it, you know, he had military clothes. He had fatigues and stuff that they didn't have when he was in, obviously. And so I was always dressing up in fatigues and running around and, and, um, <laughs> When my cousins would get together, we would run around at night and go cut people's water hoses. And uh, <laughs> we did that until one night I cut one that was live. And, uh, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> you know, I, I came home soaking wet. And and uh, that was the last time that we talked about that with dad. And, and uh, uh, you know, they were, they were really strict. I grew up really strict. Um, my dad worked three jobs. Uh, to make sure that my mother was able to stay home. And my sister and I both went to private Catholic school, which was not cheap in those days. I, I can't, I can't even believe, I know what it costs now. And, and there's no way I could afford that to send my kids there. Uh, but at the time my dad made it happen. And, 
you know, he worked a, a full time at the Express, Santa Express News for 30 some odd years. And uh, he worked for HEB doing ad comp and, and then uh, and he had a couple other miscellaneous printing jobs. And so, uh, you know, I, I played football, I played baseball, I played, uh, I ran track. Um, and so I was always doing something, you know, it, it's just different now, you know, today, even my son, uh, you know, grew up in the house playing, playing Xbox and all. I still don't know how to play any of those games. I couldn't start one of those game consoles if I had to. You know? I literally thought what you were going to say was, yeah, I used to cut water hoses right up to the point till you got whooped with one of them. <laughs> Cause you well, get whooped with a water hose yeah yeah it, it'll it'll open your life up really quick for you you so. know we didn't step too far out of line because my dad was hardcore and so uh till the day that he died um uh, probably a year before he passed away i was doing some work for him in his house and in, in the closet he needed a light put in there and so i was putting the light in there and the belt that he spanked me with was hanging in there and i was like dude this is some kind of trophy? I mean, what? That's disgusting. I'm gonna burn this thing. He's like, you leave that right where it's at. I'm like, okay. And so, you know, uh, you know, that's how we grew up. I mean, I, I, I did get whipped, but I didn't get whipped with a with a water hose. Oh, I'm telling you now, if if I just even in today, <laughs> even today, I have a feeling if I heard the sound of a belt clearing belt loops. I literally think I would still today stop in my tracks and be like, <laughs> that's me. Uh, the worst of them me. Say, wait till your dad gets home. And I'm like, oh man, I'm getting spanked for sure. <laughs> so yeah, it was, uh, but other than that, I was pretty normal, man. You know, my, my dad worked his tail off, uh, you know, for us to do the things that we did and, and we had a great life growing up. I had my, both my parents were home. They both loved us. Um, and so, you know, I don't have anything exciting. I didn't get in a lot of trouble or anything till, you know, till much later. So, all right. So let's, let me get run back a little bit. You're talking about the dude, uh, the Machado or whatever, the Air Force guy. When you got into boot camp, um, I know for some, that's a big challenge. That's a big chapter in their life. It's a, a major milestone for some of them. For some of them, that's probably the most, um, probably one of the life's most biggest achievements for, for them is getting through boot camp. Do you happen to have any friends that you made in boot camp that you still keep in contact with today? Absolutely. Uh, Darren Shafto was our uh, RPO for our company. He was our, our whatever they call him, you know, recruit uh, company commander. Uh, and I, I still, you know, he's on my Facebook. Uh, we actually reconnected not that long ago, but, you know, I still stay in touch with him. Um, more people from my ships. Um, you know, you, you make those, those, and we, we never got into any sticky situations. We used to chase the Russian subs sometimes get up by Alaska and, and uh, you, you know, cold, it was cold war. And so we would play cat and mouse with these guys, but nothing ever that, that would like bond us like combat veterans, like some of these combat soldiers coming off the battlefield, those guys are like glued together. And even though we didn't have those same kind of intense situations, uh, we're the same way. And um, I remember when I was in, I was I was determined to get out of the Navy. I was really upset with the way everything was going. And I decided I was going to eat my way out. And so, because, you know, I did all the research and I'm like, well, they, you know, the civilian sector can't hold this against me. And so I started just like double down on chow. I'd get, you know, Ski dunk, you know, mid rats. I was, man, I was hitting the galley every chance I could. And, um, and this friend of mine, Mark Ortman, he's still a really great friend. Uh, he met my dad at one point and he told me, he says, you know, okay, I, I get it. You're going to get out. What are you going to do when you go home and face your dad? What are you going to tell your dad? 
and this chill just came over me and I was like, Mark, you got to help me. I, I can't do this. And so Mark went and talked to my chief, got me on the same watt section as him. And he started out with a rope. He tied a rope to his waist and a rope to my, he was a, a Navy wrestler. Guy was like, you know, 1% body fat. He was just chiseled. And so we started running on the flight deck. We were on a small boy. So it was, it was a helo pad, but same kind of surface as a flight deck, non-skid surface. Uh, so if you fell on it, it literally cut your body to pieces. And he tied a rope to my waist and that's how we started training. And he would drag me and he says, if you fall, I'm not gonna stop. So you just get back up and keep going. And so Mark, you know, Mark changed my life literally. Um, and, and gave me a, he didn't really give me a purpose but he gave me a reason not to get out. And then shortly after we had a, uh, we had an assessment from the interior communication chief of the Navy that came on board our ship to do uh, our, our equipment. And I was able to study under him and learn from him. And I became a top technician in, in what I did. And so uh, those two things really, really transformed my, my military. And the only, the only reason I got out when I did is because I got married. And uh, at that time, it wasn't where you could say, well, hey, I'd really like to go here. Here's my first choice. Here's my second choice like they do today. Uh, back then you had to talk to the detailer. And the detailer would tell you what he had open. And, and he wasn't, uh, he wasn't gonna, um, my detailer wanted to send me back to California when I was due for shore duty. And so I was, I was having an issue with that. And so I ended up getting out. And, you know, they always say hindsight's twenty twenty. Well, that's my biggest regret because when I did finally get out, man, I was firing on all eight cylinders. Well, let's go back for a second, Jose, because when Joe asked you about if you had, you know, any friends or, you know, fellow uh, servicemen that you stayed in contact with, you lit up and I could tell that you had some really good things some memories or some traditions that you guys had um, that still hold true or something is there. I could see the excitement in you. And then when he mentioned, when you were talking about um, your journey on possibly getting out and the fear of your dad, I'm thinking water hose right there, like we were talking about. <laughs> but what was the most significant memory that you had? Because you could just see how much you lit up when he asked you. Yeah. Um, so when I made E3, uh, E4, when I made E4, when I made Petty Officer Third Class, um, Mark broke my arm. Not literally, but uh, I had already ticked off enough people on the ship where there was a whole line of people waiting to frock. Uh, and frocking ceremony, which I guess they don't do anymore because it's considered hazing. Um, but when you get your crow, the, tr the naval tradition is that everybody who's the same rank as you or higher, they come, they just give you a little tap on your shoulder so that, and the tradition is that the crow doesn't fly away so that you keep it. And, um, well, I had made so many friends, uh, by that point that, uh, there was a line all the way down the ship. I mean, people just waiting to, you know, to get one in <laughs> and so... <laughs> And so towards the end of the day, and I'm fortunately Mark is now retired. And so I'll tell this story, but I was, he was the last one. He said, I get to do mine last. And again, he, he got me from, I made first increment on the test, but I never would have got promoted had Mark not started working with me so I could lose the weight. So I could, you know, have my PT where it's supposed to be. So I could, so I could get promoted. And so uh, then there might've been a pole involved and my arm wrapped around it. I don't know. The official story is that I fell down a ladder. That's the official story. And so, uh, I was literally swollen from my shoulder to my wrist and it was all watery and, and, uh, but I have nothing but pure respect for that man. And, uh, I still talk to him. He's, uh, he's an amazing guy. That's emotional. And 
where where all were you serving with him at? Was it just that one duty station, or were you all able to stay together, bouncing no. different commands or anything? No, we, so that was the duty station we were at. We were in San Diego. We were on the USS Hepburn. Uh, and I don't remember if Mark, I don't think Mark came to the Truett. I, don't, I can't remember. It's been a long time, but um, he and I still talk. We still stay in touch. Uh, the chief that I learned all my stuff from, Chief Pickens, he's not a social media guy, but I am friends with him. I found him on Together We Serve, that website called Together We Serve. Uh, I found him and actually reached out to him. And so that was pretty cool. Uh, and his son is on Facebook. I think I'm friends with him as well. Um, and so, yeah, the those bonds are something that, I mean, those things that changed my life. Had I done what I wanted to do and just ate my way out, uh, I have no idea where where my life would have gone. I have no, that would have been such a disgrace uh, especially the way I see service now. And I look back and I'm like, you know, I ended up going on to get a Navy Achievement Award at a time when they used to just give them to officers. Um, all my, I used to get um, letters of accommodation from not just my captain, but from the commander of Surface Group 6. I've got several of those. I've got all kinds of stuff that I'm really proud of. And it's just stuff, right? That's just things. But it's the fact that I was able to, to take a turn, a pivot uh, in the direction that my life was going to go in uh, because of people who reached out. You know, they gave a hand up, not a hand out. And so that's something that has stayed with me to this day. All right. So your, your plans of service, we got to talk about and listen to how you were you were telling us, man, you you knew from day one I was gonna do this. You know, I wanted to come in and serve because my family traditions, family history, you know, you wanted to make, you know, carry on that legacy as well. Did you come in with that intention of, man, I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot for 30? Or was it like, man, I'm just gonna come in and enjoy it? Or did you know joke have not only an in, you you obviously had an entry plan, but did you have an exit plan from the beginning as well? <laughs> You know, it's funny you asked that because I did not have an exit plan. My plan was to go in, do 20 years. If they let me stay 30, I would stay 30 and then get out and, and come back to Texas and buy a ranch and have horses and do nothing. Um, and so um, I, I did not plan to get out when I did at all. And, and, and so much so that in boot camp, I denied the GI Bill because I figured, well, what do I need that for? I'm not going to go to school. I'm going to stay in the military for 30 years. And so um, when I fortunately, being from Texas, you know, born and raised here, uh, they have what's called the Hazelwood Act. And so when I did get out of the service, I was able to use that to go to school. Uh, and then in more recently, I've, I've been able to use my voc rehab uh, because I've got some disability from my knees and my hearing. And so I was able to use the voc rehab program, but without those two things, I wouldn't have been able to go back to college because, uh, you know, I was dead set on staying in the military for an entire career, not ever getting out. And uh, I always, always saw myself in one of those white chokers, you know, uh, being a chief petty officer. And, and uh, you know, that there's other stuff, but I, man, I hope we don't get into that because that, that's another part that really bothers me, you know, at a time when, uh, I got out and all my brothers were going back in because of 9-11. Uh, you know, I even had people call me, hey, what are we doing? Put our office on the instant, man, you get down to the recruiter and go because they need us. We don't have to train. They just, they're going to send us places. And so, and they're like, well, where are you going to go? And I'm like, don't worry about it. Well, at the time I was 400 pounds. And so uh, I had literally chosen food over anything else. And uh, something I still struggle with, you know, I still fight. I still fight that demon. And, uh, but I had no intentions of ever getting out of the military. I thought I was going to stay in, be an old crusty chief and, and then go home. So as you separated from the service, how was that transition? Like, do you have people helping you and getting you on your feet or was it like what we've heard? Uh, and in my case, I experienced myself. Bye.
and then you're just sitting there like like a ton of bricks hit you that that's exactly how it was uh for me too uh, i didn't know really i didn't know anything about benefits post military i didn't know um i didn't know what to do i really didn't i and you know you have all this structure and something that i did really well you know that i that i that i learned how to do really well was military and then i got out and there's you know I worked with people that didn't care about their jobs. And I was like, how are you even here? You know, get out of here, go do something. Uh, and so we, we, uh, I'm, I stayed in the area down in, uh, my last duty station was in Ingleside, Texas on the USS Truett. And then I went to a farm, a ranch uh, that is owned by MWR where we fed deer. Uh, and that was, that was my duty station. Uh, we would take people hunting and stuff like that. It was, it was all owned by MWR. And once my enlistment was over, um, I struggled. I went to school. I tried to go to school. Um, and I had to get student loans and stuff because I had no idea about voc rehab or anything. I didn't know. I didn't know about the Hazelwood Act at the time. And so I got about $30,000 in debt. Uh, going to uh, Texas A&M Kingsville. And um, after a couple of years of that, I moved to San Antonio uh, because we just couldn't make it financially in a little town that we were, we were living in a little town called San Diego, Texas. And uh, we moved from there back to San Antonio to my mom's house uh, with my mom and dad, which was a nightmare. Not because that, but you just can't take a young family and move back in with mom and dad. It's just hard. Um, and me and my ex-wife, you know, we were not doing well either. So that didn't help anything. Um, and so I kept trying to find, I finally found a job working for Harris. Uh, Harris makes, um, they make the radios that we use, you know, uh, I think the railroad uses them for line of sight communications. Um, and I got a job there working on communication equipment. Uh, that was the first time that I had gotten a job uh, one of many, uh, the guy that hired me was a Marine and he hired me solely based on the fact that I was military, but I didn't understand that. Uh, cause he told me, he said, what we do here is not what an IC does. And so I don't really have a perfect fit for you, but you know, we'll teach you. And so, uh, that was the first time that somebody hired me based on my military service. Didn't know anything about it. Didn't know what that really meant. Uh, and then over the next I don't know, 10 years or so, I literally bounced around every two years. Um, I would try to find, you know, something I, it, you know, you can't find that same environment. You're never going to find that environment uh, that you have when you're active. Duty. It's just dynamic. It's not something that you can just go get working in Home Depot or you know, anywhere else. So did you end up staying in the same type of position as what you had been trained in or were you experiencing different types of work you know, you know different occupations completely different than what you had what your MOS was it was completely different because by the time I got out of the service uh, I was uh, uh, an E5 I was the I had I had because of things that went on during, on the ship, I had become the leading petty officer of my division. Uh, and so I had, I had E6s that were under me. I had uh, all the electricians and all the interior communication guys. I was the, I was the LPO for the, for the division, for E division on my ship. And, you know, you, that's a leadership position and I had to take courses, right? And I made first increment on the E5 and I got promoted to E5, uh, you know, right away. And I had already got my uh, ESWAS, which is Enlisted Surface Warfare Qualification uh, through the board of the chiefs. And then, and then by that time, um, I had already been submitted for my Navy Achievement Award. And so it was very hard to go from a leadership position uh, with equipment that you knew inside and out and go from that to, uh, hey, can you put these little boards together? All you gotta do is screw them down into this little casting 
and then send them on down the line, put your stamp on it and send it, you know, assembly work. And so it was very difficult. It was almost humiliating. Uh, I felt defeated, like, and, and I think that's why I just kept moving from job to job because I kept looking for that dynamic uh, that I had when I was active. I kept looking for a job that would challenge me. Um, and I want to say it was about 2007 when I landed a job at Southwest Research um, uh, here in San Antonio, and they do all kinds of stuff. And that was the first time that I kind of got to start doing uh, stuff in a very dynamic environment. I mean, we used to go to work and blow things up. It was awesome. And, um, and then, uh, but the money was, I was, I had a family of four. I had my son and one of my daughters still at home and my wife, and we lived in this 900 square foot box uh, in the ghetto and, uh, or, you know, for better terms in San Antonio in the barrio, a rough area, rough Mexican area. And which is ironic because my wife is a ginger. She's a Irish German and she's got the freckles and the red hair and the whole bit. And so uh, very unusual, but that's where we lived. And, and so it was very difficult uh, time. And then I was making 1075 an hour and to try to provide my wife worked for the state making nothing. And it was just difficult. And so, um, one day I was, uh, I had, at that time, I belonged to the uh, uh, Freemasons. I was, a, I was in the Masonic order. I was in a lodge in San Antonio. And uh, I was, they, they own a, the Shriners. I was also a Shriner. The Shriners own a place in Bernie on the river. And so I was up there one weekend with my family. And I met a guy and he's like, hey, you know anybody who, um, who does HVAC? And I'm like, no. And I didn't know at the time that, that you know, 80% of HVAC is electronics. I didn't know that. And so I said, no, I don't. I said, I know one guy, but he's going to want to know what, you know, how much y'all pay. I mean, right off the back, he's not even going to talk to you. And he's like, well, we start out at $20 an hour. And I was like, say again? And uh, I was like, well, I can do HVAC. <laughs> You know, and and then the military kind of kicks in like, hey, I can do anything you want me to do for that kind of money. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll clean the toilets. I don't care. And um, and so this guy, Jerry Granado, he he is another instrumental person in my in my adult life. Uh, he's like, well, listen, I'll, I'll get you an interview and, and we'll see what goes. I can't make any promises, but uh, I need to know what all your qualifications are. You know, look, I got qualifications in hydraulics, pneumatics, electronics. I was Navy trained for electronics, you know, and I was just talking it all up. And um, I've never worked on air conditioning. I had no idea how air conditioning worked. I mean, I, you know, I used to get the cans from the from the auto parts store when the when the air didn't work in my truck and stick it on there and pull the little trigger. And that was, that's all I knew about HVAC. And so, um, but this was a turning point in my life. It was 2010, and I interviewed with two full bird colonels that were retired, both combat veteran army. And uh, and they asked real questions, and they're like, "Why are you leaving?" Everybody at your job says that they love you and they don't want you to go anywhere, and that you're a hustler. And, and I said, "I'll be honest with you." I said, "I got out in '95, and I have not found anything." where I fit in, you know, I haven't found a place where I'm comfortable being who I was trained to be. And uh, he said, you know, he went into the whole, listen, we're the tip of the spear here. This is what we do. We're all part of, you know, we're all cogs in this huge gear train and we all do our part and uh, you'll be part of the team, you know, if you come on. And so, uh, you know, that, for the first time, I got to use my electronics again, uh, and I got to use my leadership skills. And so it was like being reborn. It was pretty incredible. Do you think that that right there for the first time in your entire life was the moment that you said, you know what? I'm a success. I've made it. 
yes absolutely yes and I, I started there when I was 40 years old I started uh I actually I think I was 39 uh, when I started working there and I'd spent a lifetime to me it seemed like a lifetime uh spinning my wheels in the dirt and uh it was a rough rough time I got divorced it was horrible uh me and my second wife had a really, really rough time getting started. Uh, we had no money. My mother used to come give us $20 a week just so we could have enough money to, to make the week. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a struggle. I never thought about it. I never thought about it like I'm having trouble reassimilating to society because I didn't do nothing. In my mind, I didn't do anything. I was, I was in during peacetime, you know, I didn't have it hard. I mean, the hardest part of my life in the military was running out of money before payday, you know, and I didn't have money to go to the EN club. I mean, it was, you know, it was terrible. Ran, ran out of drinking money. I mean, it, there was nothing that I saw, you know, that, that was any kind of red flashing light that, dude, you're not, you're not doing well, you know, uh, maybe, maybe you should look, you know, at something more, more military, more along the lines of what you did. Uh, but there wasn't anybody to tell you that, you know, I mean, now I, I know we're trying to do a better job of that um, with our service members that getting out. And, and I can tell you that the groups that I belong to now uh, on Facebook and stuff like that. There's, you know, one of the groups is 15,000 veteran entrepreneurs. And, uh, you know, a good portion of them are still active duty. So they're lining themselves up so that when they get out, there's not this huge drop, um, you know, that a lot of us have experienced. You really made a good point. I know Joe too, you, you want to talk about that too. He's just making such a good point about the challenge of reassimilation in coming out. And, and what actually what he's talking about is something that needs to be talked about. It needs to be mentioned. It needs to be broadcasted and it needs to be pounded in the skulls of these people on active duty over and over and over until they realize the military side of the house is one of the most stable forms of income that we have in America. It truly is. And so for everybody that's on active duty with a stable and reliable source of income, they really need to take that in account and they really need to be efficient and maximize that to their potential whether it's what we refer to as side hustles, whether it's an entrepreneurship, whether it's an investment, something to get them, they really need to focus that time and that effort on building that retirement. Because a lot of them think that, oh, I'm, you know, I can stick this out for 30 and, you know, I can have this, this and this on that pension. I'm going to tell you now, as much as you think that that's going to help out the way that our inflation rate is going, you're going to be struggling. You might not think you're going to be struggling. Yeah, but you will. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's so true. I mean, if you think about your own time when you first enlisted, did you think, okay, I need to start plugging plugging my money away for retirement now or set aside this? I know for me, I was going I need every cent that I'm going to get in this paycheck that's coming and setting aside money for retirement or for what if this kind of thing happens was not at the forefront of my mind. It was, I need my cash. I need it now. Exactly. Uh, you know, I, uh, and, and as a result, and I'll tell you a little bit too, is, you know, I didn't plan like that. Um, I've gone through several cycles because when I was active duty, I lived on the ship, I ate on the ship, I put every dime I had aside. And so uh, when I got out of the service, I had somewhere around 30 or $40,000 in cash in my savings account that uh, my ex-family 
uh, spent on a wedding. And, you know, at the time I was like, yeah, spend it. That's what I saved it for, you know? And, uh, but never really thinking of anything past my nose. I couldn't see past my nose. And so, um, uh, when I did get divorced, I did have some retirements that I had started, uh, but I cashed them. I wish I would have had somebody tell me then, Hey, don't cash that out because later on, it's going to be a lot of money. It'd be enough for you to retire on. Um, but I didn't think about that. And I thought about, I got to get out of this without owing anybody anything. And so I sold everything I had, I cashed out everything and I paid off my debt and I walked away debt free, but I didn't realize how much I'd actually hurt myself for the future. And so when I started with this job, I, I was, I was at this job and I'm going to tell you the company because the company is a thousand percent, probably the best company I've ever even heard of much less worked for. Uh, it's called Corporate Office Properties Trust. They're based out of Maryland. Uh, and we have, we obviously, we have a San Antonio branch. We have some all over the country. And they treat their employees like they're the real value of any company, which is, un, it, you know, it's just not, you don't find that every day uh, with companies that that literally value their employees. And they did. And they had a great, you know, 401 plan. They had all kinds of stock options. They had, I mean, it's just an amazing company. And so I started 10 years ago, I started in 2010 with them and I started my retirement again and never really, you know, I thought at this point, man, I've made it, I'm done. I make a lot of money. I, you know, I have a great job, a great security, great insurance. Uh, everything is awesome. We ended up buying uh, 10 acres out in the country in Seguin that my wife and I moved out of here to. We got horses and we got rescues and all kinds of stuff that we never could do before because we couldn't afford it. And I'm still not thinking ahead, right? And so, I mean, I am because I've got a retirement now. Well, in 2016, in 2015, my dad told us that he had cancer. And so um, I didn't know how to process that and dad was not symptomatic. And so I just kind of like, whatever, you know, I spent a lot more time at home with my mom and dad. I stopped by there after work almost every other day. And I'd stop by in the morning and have coffee with dad and go to work. And so I did intentionally spend more time with him, but uh, there wasn't a sense of urgency there. And so, and there was a lot of things that were coming in my life that I didn't even have any clue about yet. And so uh, in early 2016, we found our church home. And at this time, I'm still really living off my Catholic background. I didn't know much about reading my Bible because I was never really encouraged to. And I didn't know much about, um, I didn't know what it meant to have a relationship with Christ. I didn't know what that meant. And so uh, we were, at the time I was training for a triathlon and I used to run by this church all the time with a friend of mine. And I was like, man, I'm check that place out. You know, there's a whole bunch of pickup trucks and it just, you could see the arena in the back, the rodeo arena that they had. And it looked like a really neat place. And so we went out there one day and the same day that we visited the church, we joined the church. And the pastor is this old country, you know, awesome guy. And uh, that's when my life started to change. I wanted my dad to come see that church because dad had got mad at, at uh, the Catholic church at some point, And he no longer financially supported them. And he would only go when my mother would make him go like on Christmas. And so my dad was really coarse. And he, he riddled his every sentence with profanity. And he just one of these old crusty guys. And so he goes, well, I'm not going to go to F in church with you, but uh, I'll go to dinner with you afterwards, you know? And so uh, during Sunday school that morning, dad showed up and, and my wife said, go get him and take him in before he changes his mind. And so we brought dad in and uh, Connie told Pastor Butch what was going on. And so when we started service, Butch came over to my dad, you know, before he talked to anybody and introduced himself and shook hands with him and, and whatnot. And so we went to dinner afterwards. That was on my birthday, 2016. And so um, 
dad kept telling me, Hey, I, I want to talk to that guy. Give me his email. I want to talk to that pastor. I really liked his service. And so, um, we, uh, I bought dad a Bible pastor wrote in it. I wrote in it. And then my mom called me one day, Hey, your dad's reading that Bible. And my mother, I, I call my mother the tornillo. Uh, that's the Spanish word for screw. And I said, you're like a screw that gets in your ribs and you just keep turning. And that was a joke. You know, me and my mother are always at each other like that. And, and then when we're not, she thinks something's wrong, you know? And so uh, I said, mom, don't be a tornillo and leave dad alone. Don't even let him know that you saw him reading the Bible. And so, cause I know my dad, my dad would get ticked off and, and leave me alone and get out of here. And so, uh, Shortly after that, dad went to the emergency room for the first time, couldn't breathe, and uh, he had stage four lung cancer, and so it was a matter of time before he couldn't breathe anymore, and um, and so my pastor was going to come talk to him, and we were at the hospital one day, and my, my sister, who's very involved in the Catholic church, um, she's like, hey, dad, do you want me to go get a priest, or my mom said that, I think, and, and he's like, I'm not going to talk to Catholic priest. And my sister said, well, you know, the dad, the, the hospital has lay people that can come talk to you. And he's like, no. And he looks at me and he says, I'll talk to a military chaplain, but he has to be a colonel or better. And I'm like, well, that's kind of, I mean, like trying to find a white elephant, you know, it's just not going to happen. And so I told my pastor and he's like, Hey, I got this. Don't worry about it. And so when we got dad home, pastor came over and my daddy, my mom and my sister didn't recognize him, but my dad immediately recognized him. He says, hey, I've been telling JR that I wanted to talk to you. And uh, and so Pastor Butch was just like my dad. He punched in the nose first, you know, and he's like, well, JR said that you didn't want to talk to anybody unless they were a colonel or better. And my dad had to punch right back. He said, well, that's exactly what I told him. And I'm like, great, this is not going to go well. And so Pastor says, well, Joe, he says, I'm a general. And my dad says, really? He said, yeah, I'm a general in God's army. And my dad started cracking up and he's like, well, have a seat general. And so pastor sat down next to my dad and they both looked at me like, okay, we don't need you get out of here. And so I closed the door and uh, my dad prayed to come to Christ that day. And so um, after all this time, you know, I thought I had the perfect job, which I did. I mean, I did literally, um, but I'm at another crossroads and I had no idea what it was to be in God's favor. I had no idea what God could do uh, for your life. And so dad came to Christ that day. And I, at that time, I thought I was already, you know, I had gone to a Pentecostal church uh, and we had gone to Buckner Fanning's church here in San Antonio, uh, First Baptist. And I thought I was good to go. I thought I had all the boxes checked. And uh, after dad passed, uh, he, he, did, he died about two weeks after that. So um, I still didn't understand. And my mother would call me every day. Hey, come fix it. This is broken. Hey, come look at this. Hey, come look at that. And so I spent almost a year going to mom's house every day, fixing things. And uh, we had a new pastor at our church, young guy, uh, John Mitten. Uh, he was, him and his family were in Madagascar doing mission work. And he was coming back off the mission field. And he was uh, one of our associate pastors. And I was so taken the first time I heard him preach that I wanted to talk to him. And so I met him at Willie's in New Braunfels. And we sat down and talked. And that's the first time I realized that I was not right with God. Um, because had I been right with God, had I trusted in him, had I surrendered my life to him, I would have known 100% that my dad was good. And my biggest fear was that I wasn't going to see my dad again. It took time for me to understand that, um, that I didn't have my life together. Um, I went from making peanuts living in the ghetto to living on a beautiful little spread out in the country with everything I thought I wanted. Um, my marriage was still, my wife and I would have good times and we had a, we had a whole lot more bad times than we did good times. And, and we look back at it now, we were married 13 years before I got right with God. 
And somehow we stayed married those 13 years. And that is all God. That has nothing, nothing I did for sure. Uh, and so sometime in that year after dad died, I surrendered my life completely. And that's when, that's when everything changed. All of a sudden this job, and, and let me tell you, when my, my, my grandson was born in 2014 in, in New Zealand, my daughter was living there and I, I needed money. And so I worked four, four months straight with two days off, working 12 hour shifts at night to make all the overtime, uh, to make the money to go. And I, I ended up making a crazy amount of money. We went for a whole month uh, and, and we went to go visit. So money was something that had become uh, something that I was worshiping because I knew that, you know, I could take up all these people's shifts and I could make a ton of money and I could get what I wanted. Right. Because that's, that, that's how you, that's how you get what you want in life. You make more money. Uh, and again, this is, I have zero negative to say about the company I work for. They're incredible. I would recommend anybody who ever wants to work for them to work for them, but God was already working, right? God's been working on me for a long time. I just wasn't ready. And so when I finally surrendered my life, everything changed, everything. For the first time in my life, my wife fell in love with me. 13 years after we got married. Um, and likewise, I loved her the way God intended us for us to love our wives. Uh, and so I wanted to do everything I could to share that with everybody that would listen. And so my first mentor, besides John, who was an army veteran, uh, the pastor that, that I got to spend time with was, uh, I had another mentor that was my Sunday school leader and he was an army combat veteran, 82nd airborne. Uh, he did over 61 jumps and ended up having to get a profile cause he couldn't jump anymore and couldn't get deployed anymore. Um, uh, he did three tours. I think a, a couple in Iraq and one in Afghanistan, horrible, horrible, horrible tours. Um, and he was just such a huge influence. He still is in making me understand that our purpose in life is not to look in and to see what JR wants. It's to share the gospel with everyone who'll listen and God will do the rest of the work. Where was it and who was it that brought in the support that you needed to start the coffee inside of things for you. <laughs> so, yeah, I started praying to get out of the job I was at and, uh, and not because I hated the, the, the company I worked for, but because the environment was rough. It was act like an active duty. I worked with a bunch of active duty people and I worked with federal government. I worked for the NSA. That was our customer. And it was a really rough civil service job. Uh, we weren't civil service. We were, we, it's a weird, I'm not going to get into all that, but we, that was our customer. We owned the facility. We leased it to the federal government. They were our customer. So we worked with them every day. So with that said, Jose, that actually brings up a good point to transition into talking about your coffee business. And you had a lot of good support behind you. You had a lot of good people on your side. Where did that transition come in? Okay. So I was, again, the, the job was rough. I was praying for a way out and I couldn't believe that that's what I was praying for, but I was, you know, the Bible says that, that when you surrender your life to Christ, you become a new creation. I look the same. I talk the same, but I don't act the same and I don't believe the same. And so I started praying for a way to get out of that job because it, it was, it was becoming toxic for me personally. And so I was praying for divine appointments, which is something I didn't know nothing about uh, until I was taught by my mentors. And I came home uh, from a night shift one day and I remember leaving San Antonio and I was probably halfway home when I actually like woke up and realized, how did I get here? And I had those, everything from the time I walked out of the building, got in my vehicle and left the site was, I don't remember any of it. I couldn't remember any of it. So all the way home, I was praying 
It's God, just, you know, find a way, show me what you want me to do and I'll do it. And so, you know, back in 2014, when we visited my grandson uh, in New Zealand, we went to Australia for the weekend where I had, I had fresh roasted, made to order coffee for the first time in my adult life. And then we were, you know, in New Zealand, we found this place called Robert Harris. And it was the same thing, fresh roasted, made to order. And I came home with about five pounds of Robert Harris. And then I would get my daughter to send me coffee uh, all the time from that point forward. So fast forward, uh, I started praying for a way to get out of where I was at. And I came home that morning off night shift. I got home and there was a message on my phone from some guy that wanted to friend me or he was sending me a message request. And I'm like, yeah, you know, there's a lot of scams. And, uh, but it was a picture of a man and his son. And I was like, well, that's not your usual scam. And so I clicked on it. And five minutes later, this guy says, hello from Honduras. And I was like, this is definitely a scam. And so I said, I said, you know, the guy's name was Ashley Williams. And I'm like, well, hi, Ashley, how are you? And uh, he's like, I'm great, man, you know, and uh, I saw something that you posted in one of the groups. I belonged to, in a coffee group that has like 100,000 or 300,000 members. So for him to single me out from a post with 300,000 members is a God thing. Nothing to do with me, all God. He, and so he and I started a conversation and he lives in Mount Ridge, Kansas. Uh, it's his business is called legacy farms coffee and their farm is in Honduras and they go down there and harvest. And then they, they spend about half the time down there and half the time up here. And so we started conversations and we started talking and then we got on the phone and we started having conversations and at some point he's like, man, do you, do, do you believe you ever pray for divine appointments? And I was like, <laughs> what? And so I was like, yeah, I mean, I was, I was praying for divine appointments when, when you sent me that first message. And he says, look, I don't know why, but I'm being led to help you. And I'm going to help you with whatever it takes to get you successful in the coffee business. And he says, if that means I got to give you coffee, if I got to show you how to roast, whatever it is, whatever it is, uh, I'm going to make that happen. And so, um, and then again, I'm still praying, you know, like that, that joke about when you're in Texas and it rains, you pray for rain because you never know when it's going to rain again. Well, I had a divine appointment and I was praying for divine appointments while I had one. And so uh, I ended up meeting Justin Charpentier, who is a marketing guru in one of the Facebook groups. Uh, and he has a group called Zone of Action. And I joined that and, and he's a man of God. And he's seen stuff in combat that, you know, just solidified his faith. And so he taught me the tech side and the business side of how to take this hobby, because I started literally on a steak grill with a little basket that I bought from Amazon and a, a regular barbecue rotisserie. And that's how I started doing coffee beans, because I wanted to do them on mesquite. I love mesquite. I've always cooked on mesquite. And after being in Europe and, and those places, uh, and we ended up, after dad died, we went to Italy and Greece for a couple of weeks. Again, the coffee atmosphere there is just like what it was in New Zealand, Australia. And I came home, kept trying to make that coffee. And I didn't understand yet. I, these were all these pieces that are moving, right? There's all these moving parts and I don't understand any of it. Um, I mean, how, does, how, do, how do I meet a guy in a, in a group of 300,000 people that owns a coffee farm and tells me that he's gonna help me? Well, I don't know what you're gonna help me with because I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. And then I was at the house one day and I had made coffee on the grill. And, uh, and so for some friends, and we were, we were all in a men's Bible study group. And my, my friend Robert's like, you know, this is a business waiting to happen. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I don't understand what you're talking about. What do you mean? He's like this. I mean, every time we get together, we talk about God, but we also drink coffee every time. 
And I think there's something here, you know, pray about it, see what God does. And so we kept doing that. And in 2019, we opened uh, Third Day Coffee Seguin uh, down at the courthouse. It's just a DBA. And I didn't do nothing for about a year. Uh, I kept learning how to grill on the little grill. Uh, I can only do about four ounces of coffee at a time. And then I've got this huge smoker pit that I built for a friend of mine. It was too big for him, uh, made out of 36 inch casing. And I, again, Ashley helped me out. Uh, and a friend of mine, Eric Sykes, he built a uh, stainless basket that I could do eight pounds of coffee in. And I had to buy a special motor for it and all kinds of stuff. And I started using this huge smoker pit to make coffee. And then I really started to love the coffee I was making. Um, and Ashley helped me get that down, even though it was nothing that he had ever seen before. Uh, but he really helped me with advice. And then uh, when the pandemic started um, in February, we had placed an order for right before they did the shutdown, uh, I had placed an order for a commercial roasting machine uh, that was custom built to use mesquite. So I wouldn't lose that. Uh, and it was made by U.S. Roasters Corporation. And so that's what we're roasting on today. And so God just kept showing me that what you're going to do is you're going to share my word. And the vehicle that's going to get you there is going to be coffee. Well, coffee I, is I think, coffee. <laughs> yeah, I'm about to say I she she's she's right on point with me here uh, you you've opened our one caught our attention but two opened up our eyes something that we didn't even know was out there and and how you're doing it but man thanks thanks tremendously for coming on today and sharing this with us man you're the the message that you're delivering it with your with your christianity how you're delivering it with your coffee, what you're opening to other vets, you know, to, to when you do your events, come in, sit down over coffee. I think you're going to have quite a few people taking you up on that offer alone, as you've already found out throughout your life, man. But thanks for tremendously being a positive influence and being a veteran who says, you know what, I'm going to go tackle this head on. This is what I want to do and stick in it, being that boots on the ground, grinding it out. Um, I, the more and more that we get Navy guys on the show, I love to hear that the Navy has the culture of making you a jack of all trades and a master of none. And I'm really, really glad to hear that when we are getting sailors on this show, that they have blocked that. They're not running with, hey, man, I can do everything. No, they're they're dealing with reality, even though the Navy doesn't want them to be living in reality or working in reality while they're there, trying right. to make them a master of all trades or a master, you know, jack of all trades and a master of none. But uh, anyway, you get my point. So <laughs> I'm glad that you were able to reel that in, focus on what you want to do with Christianity. Focus on the coffee roasting, man. And I I would love to be in a situation to where every single one of our events, boom, your stuff is on display. Boom, your stuff is literally, you know, the staff is able to take it and, and run with it for you. And uh, I really hope that we can support you and get getting that out there uh, for sure, man. But Rebecca? You do such a good job at it, man. Close us out, please. Well, thank you so much, Jose, for what you're doing. And I think that your vehicle to really help others in a lot of different ways around coffee is just incredible. And I want to thank you so much for sharing so many really deep-hearted things with the audience today. I think you're going to make a huge impact for everybody that's watching this show, civilians, active duty members, and veterans. And I'm really excited about what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time that y'all gave me. And just remember, third day coffee, it's the best coffee this side of heaven. <laughs> I love it.
<laughs> Absolutely love it. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to another episode of At TVO Campfire. We encourage you to share this with everybody that you know on social media, especially those who have been members or are members of the armed services. We really support everyone that is in defending the country and who has defended the country. And so please share this everywhere that you can, social media. And we're on so many different platforms now. People can even listen to us on their podcast while they're working away. Hope you'll watch though, so you can sh really share and feel the emotion that we have. Thanks for tuning in. We will see you again next time.